circumstances as hopeless as can be. That's when God wants to hear you sing. He loves to hear our praise on our cheerful days when the pleasant times Good to see you this morning, church. Glad you guys are all here. What an appropriate song for our message this morning from the book of Exodus. So let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Exodus today, chapter number 6. Exodus chapter number 6. The title of our message today is, And God Said. And God Said, found in Exodus chapter number 6. Today is a special day for me. Um, some of you guys were asking about my age uh, this last week. Today is actually my birthday. Uh, praise the Lord. Um, and you guys may be thinking, I'm 29 years old today. Okay. I think I shared with you my physical age last week, right? And so you guys know that I'm not actually physically 29 years old. But today is my 29th spiritual birthday. I got saved the third week of October back in 1993. And I'm so very thankful as this time of year comes up. I'm so very thankful for what God has done in my life over these last 29 years. He's so very good. And so let's take a look as we dive back into the book of Exodus, chapter number 6. And there's so much for us to learn as we look to see the exercise that was given here for the children of Israel to go through. And that's a perspective that I'd like for us to keep as we continue to study through the book of Exodus and see these different things that the children of Israel, uh, Pharaoh, and those that were uh, inhabited in his kingdom, the different things that God did to show himself true, and the importance of really going through that exercise. Remember, there's not any shortcut to building a relationship with God. There's no shortcuts. We've got to put in time, and we must put in the work. If you remember last week in Exodus chapter number 5, the very last verse of Exodus chapter number 5, I'm sorry, verse 22 and verse 23, I'll read this. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Lord, wherefore hast thou so evil entreated this people? Why is it that thou hast sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in thy name, he hath done evil to this people. Neither hast thou delivered thy people at all. Moses was, was beginning to uh, unravel with the circumstances that he saw before him. Before we go too, too much further, let's pray. Father, we do love you. I pray that you'd go before us as we study your word. 
Please help us to learn these things that we need to learn from Your Word today. Help us to go through the exercise looking for the uh, defining moment as we get through the different trials and tribulations that we'll go through. Lord, we pray that You just be with us today, for we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And so Moses was a little bit discouraged. How the people to really uh, get in his head, if you will. Uh, Moses was set on doing those things that God would have him to do, but as the people came and the people were discouraged, uh, it began to wear on Moses a little bit, and he shows his, his humanity here with going and actually not being very happy, and he actually calls out the Lord as if the Lord failed to uphold his part of the uh, covenant that he's talking about here. And we know that that is not true. God goes on to say here in chapter 6 of Exodus, verse number 1, the Bible says this, Then the Lord said unto Moses, Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand shall he let them go, and with a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. We remember that, that God said that initially when He was there at the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3 with Moses. And those were one of the details that I think that kind of went to the back of Moses' mind. He, He knew that God was on His side. He saw the miracles that God had performed. But the timing that Moses had in his mind didn't quite line up with that that God had in the center of His will. And Pharaoh here is about ready to get some exercise himself. Amen? Now, keep in mind, as we watch these things, as the children of Israel watch these things, as you as believers watch other believers and other people deal with the circumstances of of our lives, we can gain some things from that if we choose to exercise through it. If we choose to pay attention to it, and specifically pay attention to our own lives and really put in the work necessary for that exercise. Verse number 2 says, And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. And so Moses comes. He's a little bit discouraged here. He goes to God and says, God, I I can't believe this is happening. I don't think you've done uh, what you were supposed to do. And God is going to reacquaint Himself with Moses here a little bit more. And He reminds Moses, He says, I am the Lord. He goes on to say in verse number 3, And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of the Almighty. But by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. And I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. And God here is reminding Moses of His will and what He wants to do in the lives of Moses and Aaron and the children of Israel. And He reminds them of a covenant that God made between His people and between Abraham. And we need to turn back to uh, Genesis chapter number 17. We've got to take a look at this covenant before we move on here. Genesis chapter number 17. And be patient with me as I read through the Word of God. It's very important here that we understand what God is referring to. This is what He's talking about. God says, I made a promise and I'm going to keep my promise. Genesis chapter number 17 and verse number 1. The Bible says, And when Abram was ninety years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect, and I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. Now think about this. I don't think we have anybody here that's ninety-nine years old today. I don't think so. That's a fairly old, uh, old person to be able to live, to be 99 years old. We had a member of our church. In fact, we had a couple of members of Lighthouse Baptist Church that lived uh, a little over 100. And that's amazing to think that God would allow us to live uh, to such a ripe old age. And here, Abram is 99 years old when the Lord appears to him to first talk about this covenant. Verse number 3, And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. 
Now, don't forget what God is saying here. You know, I know in the teaching the young people, uh, the, the little kids, they love to sing that song, Father Abraham. And I don't know if you guys have sang that recently, but Father Abraham, they get, they get real ramped up over that. And it's a big deal about who Father Abraham was to these young people. It needs to be a big deal to us as we see this man that God is using here in this place where he makes a covenant. The Bible says in verse number 6 of Genesis chapter 17, And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee in their generations, for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee, until thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. This is the covenant we're talking about here as God is referring back to that time when He remembers the covenant. He's talking about this covenant here that He, that he made with Abram and, and changed His name to Abraham here. Verse number 10, This is My covenant which ye shall keep between Me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man-child among you shall be circumcised. I don't know if you guys really thought about this or not, but the circumcision as it came about was simply an agreement between man and God of this covenant of things to come. And the circumcision was man's part of participating in this covenant. Verse number 11, And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man-child in your generations. He that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house and he that is bought with the money must needs be circumcised. And so God is reminding here of this, this covenant that He's presented here to Abram. Um, and Abraham is 99 years old when God comes and brings this to him and tells him that many nations are going to come from his loins and that many kings are going to come. Now, I'm not sure how you've responded when God has given you information about what He's going to do in your life. We see Moses' response here earlier on in Exodus 3 as God was calling him to do something. Abram here is being told something that seems to go against the human world, if you will. He's 99 years old. He's 99 years old, and God says, I'm going to make many nations come out of your, your loins, and, and kings are going to be there. And think about this, as Abraham is there communing with our Lord, verse number 15 of Genesis 17 says this, And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. Or I'm sorry, but Sarah shall her name be. And I will bless her, and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Listen to verse 17. Then Abram, or Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? Abraham is trying to get his mind around this. I'll remind you that the Bible says in Matthew chapter 19 and verse number 26, But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Amen? And God is reminding them here, Luke chapter 1 verse number 37 says, For with God nothing shall be impossible. And he's beginning to, to teach here um, as he's talking with, with Abraham and telling him those things that are going to come to pass. And Moses is being reminded of that very commitment that God made with Abraham. Back into Exodus chapter number 6. We see the covenant that God had made with Abraham long before that he was going to bring the children of Israel to that promised land, the land of Canaan. He was going to give that to them to be their very own. And if you remember, there's, there were people that lived there back then when he made this covenant. 
Um, and there are people that live there now, as we're going to learn as, as the children of Israel begin to move forward to try and take hold of that promise that God has prepared for them. Exodus chapter 6 and verse number 4, And I have also established My covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel when the Egyptians keep in bondage. And I have remembered My covenant. You know, if you think that God is ever going to forget anything that He has between you and I, we are wrong. We are so wrong. We get wrapped up sometimes in our circumstances and things that are happening in our lives that can cause our minds to kind of flutter and forget who God is and how good He is and how faithful He is. He cannot sway from being faithful to you and I. As believers in Jesus Christ, He has promised us that He will never leave us nor forsake us, regardless of the circumstances that are in our life. And He reminds Abraham here in verse number 5 that He heard the cries of the children of Israel. Verse number 6, Wherefore say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will rid you out of their bondage. And I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgment. God, in these next couple of verses, He gives out several things that He says, I will, I will, I will, I will. He tells them He's going to bring them out from under their burdens. They've been in bondage for 400 years and God says, I'm going to remove those burdens from you. Not much more for you and I. I mean, when we look at this circumstance here that the children of Israel were in and being in bondage for hundreds of years, God says He's going to remove those burdens from us. Don't you think He can take some of the things from us that are even much simpler than that? He can do those things. He says, I will do them. God says, I will take you for My people. He wants to be our God. He tells the the children of Israel that He wants to take them as their people. And He says, I will be to you a God. Amen? There's a lot that goes with that that I do not believe that the children of Israel understand when God says, I am the Lord, and He says, I am going to be your God. They do not understand who He is fully yet. They don't understand the ramifications and, and how good they will have it as they turn and they rely on the Creator of this universe. God goes on to remind them in verse number 8. He says, I will bring you unto a land. I'm going to bring you unto to, to the land of Canaan. That land where I've promised you and I've promised the generations before you. And He says, I will give it to you for a heritage. He's going to give it to them. And this is something that God says is going to happen. And we need to remember that what God says is going to happen, it's going to happen. Regardless of how we see our circumstances, regardless of how we see the things standing before us, if God says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. We need to trust Him. We need to allow our faith to be exercised in a way that when we come out on the other end, our trust is increased in our Heavenly Father. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 6, the Bible says this, but without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. God is just that. And we must remember that. And we must come in faith as we face these different challenges in our life, really knowing that God is there to care for us. We can go through some great turmoil and some great tragedy in our life if we're standing next to the Lord. He can bring a comfort and a peace in our heart that nobody will ever understand unless they partake of that. You know, we talked a little bit, uh, I was talking this last week with someone about that grace that uh, people that are actually have their lives put on on the line for the Lord. Martyrs. People that are having their lives taken from them because they do not want to disrupt the testimony that they have about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They're going to keep it intact and their lives are put on the line and their lives are are taken. The book of Martyrs talks about scores of people that were martyred. We look back at that that, that church age uh, when the church first started there. Man, Christians were being killed left and right. 
And I believe that God has a special grace for those Christians because I read so many testimonies. Our, our pastor in, at Lighthouse this last week read some testimonies where people can look death in the eye with a smile on their face and sing praises to the King. Like Stephen did when he was being stoned and saying, Take, not, don't allow this to be uh, held to the, their charge, Lord. They don't even know what they're doing here. You know, God gives us a special grace when we go through some things. And boy, He gives a special grace to those that are martyrs especially. But let's take a look back here in the book of Exodus. Chapter number 9, and it says, And Moses spake to the children of Israel, but they hearkened not unto Moses. They hearkened not unto him. And you say, I wonder why they would not have listened to what he had to say. God has already performed several miracles before their own eyes. God has sent Moses and Aaron to them. And you remember how excited they were at the end of chapter number 4 with the last verse said, man, they, they believed. And they wanted to follow after those things. And, and they, were, they were broken up in their hearts that God had actually heard their prayers about being removed from the bondage that they were in. But the Bible says here that they hearken not unto Moses for anguish of spirit and for cruel bondage. And you think about where the children of Israel have been for a very long time, in bondage, under Pharaoh, living as slaves. You know, a lot of times when I read Scripture, I try to put myself in the shoes of those that I'm reading about or those that are writing uh, as the Holy Spirit gives, uh, gives direction there. And when I look at these things that the children of Israel are going through, and I think about the bondage in itself, to have generations and generations and generations of your own flesh and blood be found in slavery and harsh bondage. I mean, think about that in itself. The, the emotional state that one can be in if they're having to live through that and they don't have a solid relationship with the Lord. Man, I could think they could be emotionally distraught. There's a lot of things that can happen there. But the bondage, those things that they had been enduring, are part of what's hindering them from hearing what Moses has to say. And by the way, hindering them from hearing what God has to say to them through Moses. The Bible also says here in verse number 9 that the reason they didn't listen to them was because of anguish of spirit. And when we look at that meaning of, of anguish, the simple meaning of that is severe mental or physical pain or suffering. That's what anguish means. To be in anguish over something. To be in severe mental or physical pain or suffering from something. Now, we look up some, some synonyms to that. Listen to what this really entails. Pain, torment, torture, suffering, distress, angst, misery, sorrow, grief, heartache, heartbreak, unhappiness, woe, desolation, despair. These are all the feelings and all the things that go along with having anguish of spirit. You and I have lived in those places. We know what this is talking about. We've had times where we've been unhappy and been sorrowful and, and had to grieve. And, and all these things that we're talking about here, these are some of these emotional strings that are pulled in our lives as humans as we experience things. But I want to challenge you with this. We can't allow those things to hinder us from hearing what God has for us. We can't allow it to send us to a place deep within our own heart and soul where we really do feel despair and we really feel like we're on an island on our, on our own without the Lord. We must remember that He says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. We have to remember that. I'm reminded in Exodus chapter 2 and verse number 23, the Bible said this, and it came to pass in process of time that the king of Egypt died and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage, and they cried, and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. This is the mind frame that they're in here. 
This is the place that they are living in as Moses comes to them again. Now remember, Moses is a little discouraged himself. He got railed on a little bit by the people, remember, as they, they came back from, from seeing Pharaoh and the bondage was being uh, put on them more and more and more and they were made to work more and their resources were taken and man, they were being ridden harder and harder and harder. This is the place that they are mentally right now. And we've been in this place. Some of us have walked through this road in our lives. The question is, how will we respond to this? How will we respond to the brother and sister that comes alongside and they're in that place of despair? Are we going to jump right in on that bandwagon with them and say, man, you're right. Your life is terrible. I can't believe that's happening to you. You might as well just forget it. Pack it in. Give up. Would we really do that? You know, there are people that do that. Those are people that stir the pot, if you will. They come in and they try and stir up your circumstances, not to try and help uh, benefit you or encourage you at all, but just simply to stir the pot. And I really believe that the enemy is behind that because he knows that discouraging words will impact us. I'm going to remind you of Ephesians chapter 3 and verse number 20. The Bible says, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Amen? According to the power that worketh in us. God is able to do far above even what our puny little minds can come up with as a best case scenario. We sang the song farther along. You know, we don't know much of anything on this planet here. We don't know what God has uh, in store other than we can, we can see what's going to happen at the end, but a lot of those details in between, they're unclear to us. And if we're not careful, we can be caught up in those circumstances and those little details, and we can be discouraged by our enemy as he uses those circumstances to just come along and stir things up in your heart. Don't allow him to do it. Don't allow him to do it. 2 Samuel chapter 22 and verse 31, the Bible says, As for God, His way is perfect. The Word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all them that trust in Him. Every one of us that decides that we're going to put our trust in Him, we can know that God is going to be a buckler for, him, for us, and we know His way is perfect. The Bible tells us His Word has been tried. We see that God is the Creator of this universe, and He's on our side. Amen? He's on our side. The book of Job, chapter 13, verse number 15, the Bible says, Though He slay me, yet will I trust Him, but I will maintain my own ways before Him. Regardless of my circumstances, I'm going to stand as God would have me to stand. I'm not going to allow the circumstances of life to come in and squish me down to where my words are going to be that of discouragement to my brothers and sisters around me. It's easy to happen. You know, you have to guard against this on purpose. You can't just say with words that you trust God and expect that your response is going to be appropriate and godly when you get into the fire. We've got to do some work. Remember, there's exercise for us to do. Verse number 10 of Exodus chapter number 6. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Go in, speak unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, that he let the children of Israel go out of his land. And Moses spake before the Lord, saying, Behold, the children of Israel have not hearkened unto me. How then shall Pharaoh hear me? Who am I of uncircumcised lips? And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron and gave them a charge unto the children of Israel and unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Moses comes and he's discouraged here and he's saying, Lord, I don't know how I'm going to do this. And the Bible clearly tells us that God gave to him a charge, some words to be able to speak to the children of Israel. And then he gave him some other words that he's going to go and he's going to speak to Pharaoh. And God, through his amazing power is encouraging another human on this planet by the name of Moses. While he's down in the dirt, while he's, while he's thinking in his own mind, man, I don't see how this stuff is really going to pan out. I, I don't understand. I know God said He's going to work this out, but look what's happened already. This is just the beginning of the exercise session. It's just the beginning of it as we enter into Exodus chapter number 6. 
Verse number 14, these be the heads of their fathers' houses. And the Bible goes on here to list a number of folks that were present at this time while this event is taking place. And God is giving us this for a very reminder. You know, there's a whole host of people that are here that are listed in these next several verses that were there at this time that God used not only to speak to Pharaoh, but to encourage the hearts of one another. There's a number of them here. And as we read through this, we see all these ones that are here. Listen what the Bible says, verse number 27 of Exodus chapter 6. These are they which spake to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring out the children of Israel from Egypt. These are that Moses and Aaron. And it came to pass on the day when the Lord spake unto Moses in the land of Egypt, that the Lord spake to Moses, saying, I am the Lord. Speak thou unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all that I say unto thee. I think God's being very patient with Moses here. He's going to be very patient with us too. He doesn't want to squish us down. He's not going to, he's not going to overdo his part. Even though we may feel pressed down at times and, and we may feel that, man, God isn't hearing us, and, and, and maybe He really doesn't want me to, to do this or that. or You know what? God is never going to give you too much. God is here to make us strong. You know, I talked about being in the gym and the, the you know, parallel of this and lifting weights. And, you know, after you've been lifting weights for a long time, a long period of time, say you've been in the gym for 30, 40, 50 minutes, you know, your muscles begin to get tired. They start to hurt. You're in pain. You're starting to deal with things in your mind, this mental anguish that goes on of wanting to quit and not wanting to move forward to be able to exercise the way you should. And I remember laying on a bench as a young man and really trying to press up this weight off me. And I've been doing it for a long time and I knew I wasn't going to be able to do it anymore. And a man behind me came and simply put his hand underneath the bar and began to slowly assist me to bring that bar up. And just a little bit of assistance, not very much at all, I was able to do it again. And my mind's telling me that I need to quit. And I said, good, I'm done, put this up. No, you're going to do another one. Ah, and he helps me again. And the pain that was there was something that was tremendous. And when I'm done with that one, oh, I'm going to put that bar up. No, you need to put one more down. If you put one more down, you're going to be stronger yet. You know, with the help of God, he will help us to be that strong Christian that He's called us to be. He's going to help us to be that one, just like all these that are listed here, that one that's going to impact other people for His kingdom. I would say don't allow yourself to fall into that place where Moses was, where you think that you cannot be used of God. You know, we already talked about physical age not being that thing that you ought to look at in terms of service for God. If you're breathing air still, God will use you. God will do something with you. You know, today's my spiritual birthday, 29 years old. I can imagine what I would be like if I'd have never went to the gym for the last 29 years. The spiritual gym. I wouldn't be standing before you today. I wouldn't have those experiences and those building blocks in my life where I can say, man, I trust Him. I trust Him. I trust Him. I trust Him. And all those blocks as they go up before, there's a big shield in front of me where I can say, I trust Him and nothing is going to put me aside. I trust Him. He's in this. He knows what He's doing. He's called me. He's going to give me what He needs to give me to do that thing that He's called me to do. Amen? You know, I, I've shared with you guys before uh, times in, in being in different places around the city in Southern California and just simply going and talking to somebody. Somebody that's on the street. Somebody that doesn't have a home. Somebody that a lot of people might look at and think, man, this, this person looks really evil. And there's a lot of evil that's out there on the street today. But you know what? I'm so very thankful that God can encourage me, this lowly person that I am, just because I'd obey and go talk to some folks that he's asked me to. And I don't know if I brought this up in here before, but you know, have you ever been given anything by a homeless person? All those people are normally asking you for something. They want something. That's why they're wanting to talk with you. Have you ever been given anything by somebody who has nothing? 
God has encouraged my puny little heart and mind by having homeless people give me stuff after talking with them. I mean, imagine that. People that have nothing wanting to give me something. You know, there was a time, I, I think I shared with you, my, my blueberry muffin and my, my, my coffee that he gave me. I used to love to go to 7-Eleven and get those items with another brother of mine that I served with, Craig Wilson, and, and there came a time where finances didn't allow me to go and spend that cup of coffee and that blueberry muffin. And I remember sitting in a parking lot waiting for a job interview to happen, pining away, if you will, just sitting there like, man, Lord, do you really want me here? You want me going there? And Although I, I don't want to be here, I want to leave, I need to get out of here. And, and honestly, I'll tell you this, it's the worst secular job that I ever had in my life that I was about ready to interview for. And I thought, man, Lord, how could you bring me to such a place? Why am I here? And as I sat there nervously in my vehicle waiting to go in there, I, I got out and I went to go wash my hands up in a little jack-in-a-box that was right there. Not going to buy any food, just going to go in the restroom, burn up a little bit of time. And a homeless lady comes up to me with my cup of coffee and my blueberry muffin and says, here, you need to have this. I know I'm not going to have that. You, you have that. You need it more than I do. And no, no, I'm full. I've already been fed. I need you to have this. And I took it, and I went back to the car, and I set it there, and I didn't know exactly what it was for a few moments. I sat there and thought, I cannot believe what God just did, especially after I opened up that little bag and saw that it was a blueberry muffin. God can speak to us so very clearly in our circumstances if we'll simply pay attention to what He's doing in our lives. Psalm chapter 4 and verse number 5, the Bible says this, Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. Sometimes folks will say, well, I don't know what the will of the Lord is for my life. You know what? Participate in those sacrifices of righteousness. Live your life as the way that God says we ought to live our lives. Amongst other people, they're going to see your light. They're going to see those things of, of, of what you stand for as you stand in the Lord. Psalm 16.1 says, Preserve me, O God, for in Thee do I put my trust. Can you really say you trust Him this morning? This exercise that the children of Israel are getting, to go, getting ready to go through right now, I promise you, it's going to mirror our lives. It's going to mirror our lives as we go like this, and we go like this, and we go like this, and we go like this. As we go up and down, trying to deal with the circumstances of our very own lives and live in a godly way. I would encourage you to come to the spiritual gym with me. We've got to put in the work. Amen? We have to put in the work. And I would say, don't wait for next Sunday to show up for us to be able to get into Exodus chapter 7 to start looking at these miracles as they begin to unfold. But I would say, get into this book this week. Read it over and over and over and over. I'm not sure how you study. I have a lot of different ways that I study the Word of God. But one of the things I love to do is just to read over and over and over and over those things that are in God's Word. They're not going to get old. They're going to they're sit within our heart and our mind. And God and the Holy Spirit are going to be able to bring those things up in the time that we have need for them. And so I would encourage you this next week, to do just that. Get into the book of Exodus. Go back and read from Exodus chapter 1 through Exodus chapter 7 and, and think about these things that the children of Israel are, are, are going through and are getting ready to go through as we prepare for our study again in Exodus chapter 7. You know, this next week you may go through some severe mental or physical anguish. You may feel like you're suffering this next week. You may feel like you're in great pain. You may have heartbreak. You may have despair. But I want to encourage you in this. God is still on the throne. Amen? Don't allow your ears to be closed to the Word of God because of our circumstances. Let's allow this time as we study through and we see the exercise uh, that's being put on the children of Israel here. Let us see how this is profitable for us too. We must go to the spiritual gym. We've got to go every single day. I would encourage you to be in God's Word. Pray often throughout the week. Communicate with one another throughout the week. Encourage your brothers and sisters in Christ. Because we have an enemy that's real. And he wants to press us down. He doesn't want us to have the victory. But once again, we've read the back of the book, right? 
And we know that we win. We serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You know, if there's anybody here that does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, it is the best decision you can ever make in your life. The very best decision you can ever make in your life. I don't regret any moment of the last 29 years of my life in serving the King of Kings. It's been a great privilege. And I look forward to continue to serve alongside each and every one of us here. If you haven't trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, I pray that you would just come to me this morning so that I might be able to talk with you further from God's Word on what it means to be saved. Let's pray. Father, we do love you. We thank you so much for your goodness. We thank you for these examples that we have in your Word that we can learn by and we can live a profitable, godly life as a result of listening to them. Lord, I pray that you'd help us not to stop our ears this week. Help us not to be caught up in our circumstances. Help us not to be found in that place to where we are not hearing your words clearly come from your mouth. Encourage us, Father, for we are looking to you, the author and finisher of our faith. We love you, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful Sunday.